Today we're going to read from John chapter 14, verses 5 through 12. Thomas said, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? And Jesus said, I am the road, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. Philip said, Master, show us the Father, then we'll be content. You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand? To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. Believe me, I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see. These works. The person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, but even greater things, because I, on my way to the Father, am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. cough drop this time so I didn't choke the sermon <laughs> let's start with prayer Father in heaven we do thank you and praise you Lord Lord as we read your word today and, and talk about it Lord help it to not fall on vain ears Lord but let's hear what the spirit is saying to the churches to apply it to our lives Lord as we enter into this Advent season help us to be the kind of people that we're called to be to know that this is a time of giving Lord, but also to press upon our hearts that it's not about a baby in a manger, but a baby that came to die for the sins of mankind, that came to create division, as Jesus just said in previous words that we said, to ignite members of their own household into discord because of their faith. Lord, Jesus also said that if we don't love him with all of our heart and mind and body and soul and strength and follow after him, we're not worthy for the kingdom of heaven. Please, Lord, give us the faith that we need, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, to be like Christ in this world. Help us to hear your words and to apply them to our lives because they're written on our hearts and guided by the spirit, Lord. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled this The Greatest Tragedy of All, and I want to start with reading the devotion from yesterday. I hope you read it. It's based on the scripture from Ephesians chapter 5. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time. And we only have a certain amount of time. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the devotion reads this way, Now is the time. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Nothing confronts us with our creaturely, creaturelyness. Get that out, kind of. Quite like the watch that we wear on our wrist or the clock that ticks on our wall. Try and think about no time. It's virtually impossible for us to do. God, who is outside of time, created time so that we might live each moment that He has given us for His glory. We don't like to face it, but Scripture frequently calls us to face life's brevity. It tells us that our life is a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. The Bible confronts us with the transience in this way, not to manipulate us or to crush us, but in order that we might be sensible. We need to be reminded of how quickly time passes, especially when we're young, because we tend to think that we have more time than we really do. 
The Bible almost always addresses us in the now. Now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, in other words, is the time to be reconciled to God. Now is the time to take heed, not someday over the horizon. Now is the time to hold, up, hold out the gospel message to those around us. You are not to live dominated by the regrets of yesterday or the anxieties of tomorrow. You are not to live as though you will always have a tomorrow on which to do what you should be doing today. You are, faced, <clears throat> you are to face the facts squarely head on that the future comes in at a rate of 60 seconds a minute. The time that God has allowed, uh, allotted you is quickly passing by. If you're not careful, it will be gone before you realize it. In Psalm 90, the psalmist prays, teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. That's Psalms 90, verse 12. May this prayer become your own, and may God enable you to be a good steward of the time that He has given to you. Today is a great day to enjoy your salvation, to speak of it. Now is the time to be sure of it. And I entitle this, The Greatest Tragedy of All. That leads so well in today's message. Some say the ultimate tragedy is death. There's no coming back for that. It's something you fear you, or, or you don't fear. If, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't at all. In fact, you should be longing for the day that you meet Christ. And you should be realizing that you have a job to do in this world until that day is done. If you go into your workplace and you've got X amount to get done before that 5 o'clock bell rings or whatever the time factor is, you work to get that job done. That's just sensible. It's reasonable. And your life was purchased. It belongs to God. Redeemed from the gates of hell, from the eternity in hell, where God's wrath would be taken out upon you. And given adoption as His child so that you can live by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the words says that Mark read, that you can count on it, that, that Jesus is going to tell the Father to send the Holy Spirit, so greater things that you will do in this world when He is gone. And He is at the Father's hand interceding for you, that you are His child, and the Holy Spirit seals you that you are His child for that day of redemption. The greatest tragedy of all, what is it? It can't be death, because it's certainly not for a believer. The day will come when death will come. No matter how death comes, no matter how tragic it is, whether it's before the baby ever comes out of the womb, or it's at old age, or it's an accident that, that leads to it, or whatever it is. Those things are tragedies, but nothing is as tragic as not knowing Jesus Christ when your life is over. That is the greatest tragedy of all. And Scripture is clear, Jesus' words are clear, and we're getting to the time now where He's going to teach a lot of parables, which means people are either hearing and understanding and doing, or they are not hearing, because their hearts are hard. And they're hearing God's Word, and they say, Oh, yes, I believe this, or they say, No, I don't. But it's not impacting their heart. It's not written upon their heart. It's not changing who they are. They're not showing signs and fruits of repentance. That's a tragic death especially when they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth because I thought I would be in heaven. But do we hear from the words of Jesus' mouth, Depart from me, I do not know you. That is the greatest tragedy of all. In Luke 13, I'm going to start in verse 22, Then Jesus traveled throughout the towns and villages, teaching, teaching as He made His way to Jerusalem. He knew what faced Him in Jerusalem. It's why He was born. He was born to die for the sins of mankind to break the bondage of sin, the penalty of sin, the power of sin in your life, to defeat Satan, to crush the serpent's head. Lord, someone asked him, will only a few people be saved? Here Jesus is interrupted again. This is not in what he's going to be teaching, necessarily teaching about, but it is what he teaches about because it's exactly what was God planned. Will many be saved? Or will only a few be saved? Do you think the question was from my heart, if I was the one asking it? Or do you think it was from a judgmental heart? In most cases, it would be from a judgmental heart, because if I've asked that, especially if I'm an Israelite, I think I'm somebody. I'm standing in my own righteousness again. I've got the law. I've got the prophets. I've got the temple. But do I have Jesus' words written on my heart? 
And I say that because it applies so much to the church today. Because they go to church, they do things, and they think they're fine in their salvation. But are they willing to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after Jesus? Are they willing to suffer for the King? Are they willing to go and sell everything and give it to the poor so that they can follow Jesus? Or do you make excuses for today and say, I'll do it tomorrow? Or maybe you're not willing to do it at all. So is Jesus your Lord and Savior or not? Will only a few be saved? I like to look at other people and say I'm better than them. I want to hear from Jesus these reassuring words that Israel will be saved. The church will be saved. Good people will be saved. Those that call upon the name of the Lord, because I can quote a scripture. But do you really call upon the name of the Lord? Or do you just call out in vain? Are your lips far from Him? Jesus is on His way to the cross, and He's already told us several times what it means to be His disciple. And remember, Jesus calls you a disciple, calls you to, to, to forsake all and come and follow Him long before the word Christian was ever talked about. The word Christian came about in Antioch because people were living like Christ. It was evident what their faith was because it was seen in the way that they lived. And he went through the towns and villages teaching because he knew the day was coming soon when he wouldn't be able to teach anymore, but we would have proof because all of the, the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to the Messiah said he would suffer and die, and then he'd be raised again so that you know that he has the power over death so that you know when you face death that you can trust in your Master and Lord to say that you'll be resurrected again, that you'll be the first fruits. <coughs> So he teaches the towns and villages how to know that they have forgiveness of their sins and eternal life and that they are part of the kingdom of God, a child of God. So the question you have to answer, answer for yourself is how tragic will your life be that day? Because many, Scripture says again that many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty miracles in your name? I don't know about you, but that's scary. I'm not scared of my salvation. I'm confident in my sal salvation again because I know that the Spirit of God is compelling me to move forward. Sometimes I resist against that, but he's, He is conforming me into the image of Christ day by day by day as I feed upon His Word, as I pray to the Father to give me more of His Spirit, as I commune more with the church and use the spiritual gifts that He's given me together to build up the body of Christ. I know that I am but I still wage war against my Lord and Savior many times, and I have to, to humble myself and get down on, on my knees and tell my Father in heaven to forgive me. And I know that He's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. But I have to look and examine my life and say, is there proof? Are there any things that are snagging and hindering along the way? Are there any sins that are entangling me? And we're supposed to do that together and run this race with perseverance. The one that's marked out for us. Salvation is offered to all men. Now we're going to take out, we're not going to go down these roads today about predestination and election and all these things. But salvation is offered to all men. It's a free gift. But will you take it? Will you use that gift proving that you have taken it? Will you on that day hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant? Or will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth because Jesus says, Depart from me, I don't know you. The question again was, Lord, someone asked him, Will only a few people be saved? I'll say again, the thought in Israel was that Israel would be saved. They took Scripture again, but twisted it and made it for their own thing. Said, oh, I know that part about love my enemy, but this guy, Jesus really doesn't mean him. Or whatever it is in your life that you stumble over those Scriptures. I know Jesus said to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow him, but I don't have a love for money like that guy did. How much are you giving of your time and your money and your talent? Or how much are you building up treasures here on earth? Who's going to spend that inheritance when you're gone? Are you rich towards the kingdom of heaven? 
Are you living each day as though today might be your last? Scripture is clear that all of Israel will be saved, but there is only a remnant that has the faith of Abraham. A remnant. A very small number. Because the way is narrow. It's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. You know, as I was studying the scripture and stuff this week, it dawned on me. If that doorway is narrow... Generally, doors are built, you know, in a certain proportion. So if it's narrow, it most likely is not as tall either. And that got me to thinking, you know, that way means that I've got to humble myself and come through this. I can't sit there in my own pride and my own self-righteousness. I need to humble myself before the king and say that I am, my righteousness is as filthy rags and look at that sin debt that Jesus has paid for me and given me the gift of eternal life and calling me a child of God already seated in heavenly realms and given me a heavenly bank account to withdraw from with the Holy Spirit that the more I pray and the more to seek to be like Christ, the more my Father in heaven is going to answer that and give me more of His Spirit. You need to be totally sure of that answer. Whoever that person was that day, it seems like from Jesus' answer, and seems like from the, the opposition he was getting and everything, was asking for their own self-justification again. That Jesus' answer would be, yeah, Israel will be saved. But that wasn't Jesus' answer. And Jesus didn't answer as he normally does a lot with a specific answer. Here's how he answered. Jesus answered, make every effort. Wait a minute. I'm not saved by my effort. I'm not saved by my righteousness. My, my works don't mean anything to my salvation. But again, the Scripture says all throughout that if I am saved, my life will show it by the things that I do, not just by the words that I say, but how I live my life. I don't know what your version says. Mark read from the message again today. Yours may say something different than make every effort. But the word is agonizimia. I don't know if I butchered that or not. Ag ag agonize. Sounds a lot like it, doesn't it? To agonize, to strive to the point of pain and suffering. Make every effort to enter the narrow door. Something that's worked hard at it. If we take that again into like Olympic games, it's just so much done in Paul's letters and things like that. If it's a sporting competition, there are many fans, aren't there? I mean, we're part of the football thing. There's tons of fans and everything. There's players and coaches and everything else, but there's only a few teammates, that aren't there? And then there's only a few of the teammates that really shine, aren't there? Take that to the Christian life. Are you making every effort? Are you agonizing over it? Trying your best, even if it means suffering, to live a life of self-denial, to live a life of persecution and death so that you can follow after Jesus so that you can wear the title of Christian with honor because you are like Christ. You are a little Christ. Are you making every effort to do that so that you'll enter through the narrow door? For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. There we've got the many versus the few again. There's plenty of people out there in this world that say, oh, there's plenty of ways to heaven, or I don't care about it, or, or whatever it is. But we've got X amount of people that are trying to enter the door. That's a small number compared to the total, and only a few of them will actually enter it. So how many will be saved, Lord? Will a few or many? What, how many will be saved? You make every effort to enter through the narrow door. So I've got to sit here at my, at my life and at this point in the Gospel of Luke and say, is my life showing this? No. It's not. 
I'm the pastor of this church, and I don't make every effort. I make efforts. But it says make every effort. Is the gospel message the most important thing in my life? And if I knew that would lead to my children's salvation, and my grandchildren's salvation, and my, even my enemy's salvation, your salvation, my enemy's salvation, everything, wouldn't I make every effort? So why do we let other things entangle us? Why do we worry about other things? All of Luke's gospel has led up to this. I challenge you to go back and read it straight through up to this point. It's, it won't take as long as you think. And if you think again about how much you prepare for just food today, physical food, you could read it through Luke's gospel in the time you probably spend in preparing your food, eating your food, and so forth. Many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. They won't be allowed because they haven't been saved. You can't enter a door, regardless of its size, if Jesus shuts it. He's either opened the door for you or he has not. This is a sobering fact. But the door is open if you hear his words and respond. If you repent because the kingdom of, is, of heaven is at hand and you produce fruit showing that you have repented. Because most will strive, but not really strive, <laughs> To enter that narrow door, they'll say, I've strived, I went to church, I gave here my tithe, I helped this person here and there. But did you agonize over entering the narrow door? There's a big difference there. Philippians 2, verse 12 to 16, Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act on, on behalf of His good purpose. Is that your life? Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God. Not illegitimate children, but children with an inheritance. Children that belong to the kingdom. Children who can cry out to their heavenly Father. And as you ask, He will give you more of His Spirit. Children of God without fault in a crooked and perverse generation, which is still the way this world is if it's not worse than it was, in which you shine as lights in the world, as you hold forth the words of life, in order that I may boast on the day that, of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Paul is saying these words about himself. Paul who definitely strove to enter that narrow gate. He's saying, I want you to show what you believe is faith so that I'm not disqualified. Is this how you believe? Is this how you live your life? Do you agonize over entering the narrow, straight gate that leads to life? <clears throat> Before Paul wrote those words to the church at Philippi, he wrote these words. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement in Christ, do you have encouragement in Christ? Paul says, if you have any, just a minute amount. If you have any comfort from His love, do you have comfort from the love of Christ that died for you? If you have any fellowship with the Spirit, is the Spirit it, 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 abiding in you, sealing you for the day of redemption? If you have any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of self-ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Each of you should look not only for your own interests, but also the interests of others. Is this how you live your life? Is this how we live our life as a church, just in this family? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Maybe your uh, scripture here is italicized or, or, or set differently because it's set into song-type form. It's like a Christian hymn. Who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but He emptied Himself, 
taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. So our example here is Jesus Christ who gave up heaven, who knew he came here to live and die, who denied himself of the finer things in life so that he could lay down his life as a spotless blemish sacrifice for your sins. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue that confess, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Maybe that door you've got to bend down enough where you have to take a knee to kind of get through it. But I'm going to tell you by what scripture says here if you're not bowing now and taking a knee now you will. The choice is whether you've done it now so that you can enter through that gate or not. Christ in the form of God here came to this earth so that we would see the pattern to follow in human form. And as He did it, He opened the door that whoever would believe in Him might come in. But that door is small. And though many go to find it, they don't strive hard enough. They don't have the fruits that show the proof of, of, of their belief. Not that their works of righteousness will save them again. I'll say that again. But that it was not written in their heart so they don't truly live it out. They say they believe it, but their life doesn't show it. And the door is shut instead of open to them. And who knows at what day that door could be shut. It might be shut before your life is over. Look back at Pharaoh and his example. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Read the scripture and then it says God hardened his heart. When God hardened his heart, there was no point for Pharaoh turning back then. How many times have you heard Jesus' words and they fell on a heart of stone rather than a heart of flesh that could be penetrated and responded to? Luke 13, verse 24, Make every effort to enter the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able. After the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will stand outside knocking, saying, Lord, you know who Jesus is by title, but you don't know him in your heart because you didn't live for him. Lord, open the door for us. But... He will reply, I don't know where you are from. Where are you from? Are you an alien and a foreigner in this world because you've been redeemed and your citizenship is in heaven? Or are you still living for this world? Scripture tells us clearly again that we are to live totally different than the Gentiles do. Not to fear the things that they fear. Not to live for the things that they live for. To know that our Heavenly Father cares for us and will provide for us. And we have a mission to do. And greater things, as Mark read in the Scripture again, you will do because Jesus sends the Holy Spirit here to combine us as a body of Christ. You can count on it. <clears throat> do you belong to the world? Or are you a child of the kingdom of God? From here out, I'm going to tell you again, you're going to see parable after parable after parable in Luke talking and explaining about the kingdom of God, further teaching illustrations that come alongside so that you'll understand or you'll be forever hearing and not perceiving. Verse 25, Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and we taught in your streets. We fellowship. We had communion. That's what that means when we ate and drank. We had fellowship with you, Lord. We went to church. We even went out and did your, your, your ministry. We taught the gospel message. And he will answer, I tell you, I don't know where you are from. Depart from me, you evil doers. How can you be an evil doer if you were doing the works of God? Scripture tells us again that there will be many anti-Christs, many false preachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, that preach a different gospel. And that's one reason the church is so watered down today, especially in this country. Because we don't teach the suffering servant, we teach prosperity or whatever else it is, so we fill the doors rather than not. Because only a few will be saved. Only a few will strive 
to enter that narrow door. They won't agonize over it. And if they're not, their door may be shut to them. What a tragedy. On the day the master gets up and shuts the door, it's game over. You better know where your seat is, whether it's in the kingdom of heaven or if it's not. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? In order that in the coming ages He might display the surpassing riches of His grace, demonstrated by His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by work so that you can boast. For we are God's workmanship, or the NLT says masterpiece. I always go back to that one. Because you are God's workmanship. He is doing it in you, but you are a masterpiece because God doesn't make any bad things. <laughs> you are a new creation in Christ Jesus to shine brightly like Christ in this world. Created in Christ Jesus, what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance as our way of life. This is how a disciple of Christ is supposed to live so that you'll be identified with a Christian so that even if you're, you're, you suffer for it or anything else, people will come and ask you the hope that you have and then you can tell them about the faith that you have in Christ Jesus. Is the Jesus way the way that you live your life? Is the door still open to you? Have you entered in? Maybe you think the door will stay open, like I said, but you have no idea the day that the master will get up and shut that door. You better be sure you've entered in and you better show proof that you're living your life because your heart has been changed and you are a new creation in Christ. And all you've got to do is pray to the Father in heaven that he will give you more faith, that those things of this world will grow strangely dim, Maybe you heard and responded. Maybe you haven't. I'm hoping and praying that it, with each and every one of you that the door is open. I'm hoping that you have entered in. And as again I've said before, as a burden of a pastor, you don't only have the burden that people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but you have the burden that people live a life worthy of the calling that they have. Hebrews 3, verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. In the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tested and tried me, and for forty years saw my works. Therefore, I was angry with that generation, and I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I swore an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That was Israel who had the prophets, who had the law, who had the temple, who had the covenants. And then later in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever enters God's rest also rests from his own works. Every Christian has a job to do to be like Christ in this world. They've been given the authority of Christ and they've been given the power to do that. Are you living that way? For whoever enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that none will fall by following the same pattern of disobedience. Are you hearing God's word and obeying? Are you hearing and obeying some? Is God's word written upon your heart to the part that it's the passion of your life to live like God? Christ in this world so that you can light the way for others to find that narrow door. Is there proof in your life that you're a child of God? Back to Luke 13 verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself are thrown out. People will come from the east, the west, the north, and the south, and they will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. 
And indeed, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because I did not realize I thought I was a part of. I knew what all this was. We're not talking about weeping and gnashing of teeth again for those who rejected Jesus Christ, just purely rejected Him. We're talking about people who wanted to associate with God or Jesus but didn't want to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after Him because it was a professing faith with their lips only, not something that was written upon their heart. They were fans. They never became part of the team. However you want to look at the analogy, they knew who Jesus was, but He was not Lord of their life, so He was not their Savior. People will come. There will be people from all over, from every tribe, from every tongue, every nation, who said, I believe, and put in their heart Jesus Christ, and it changed who, the way, who they were. However that looked, from the greatest to the smallest. But I'll tell you again, Jesus said, Indeed, some who are last will be first. The least of these, whether they've given up everything or never had it to begin with, and some who are first will be last because they aren't willing to give up the treasures of this world, for eternal salvation. What does it profit a man if he owned the whole world but lost or forfeited his soul? Most hypocrites don't want to hear and obey. They want to hear and say they obey. So it's time again that you need to examine is Jesus the master of your life? Or does He just give simply good teachings that you should follow? Is He Lord of all? Do you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And love your neighbor as yourself. How can you have that anger and animosity in your heart for your neighbor? How can you love God who you haven't seen and not love your neighbor? Regardless of what they do to you. Especially if they do it because of your faith. Scripture tells you that you should expect that. Verse 31 of Luke 13, At that very hour some Pharisees came to Jesus and told Him, Leave this place and get away because Herod wants to kill you. But Jesus replied, Go tell that fox. Here we got the Pharisees again changing the, the, the subject or whatever it is or not wanting people. They, they come in there and trying to steal away. It's kind of like the seed planted on the... Uh, hard soul and, and Satan sending the Pharisees in they don't even realize it to snatch that seed up and they're telling Jesus you better get out of here or you're going to get killed not knowing that that's why Jesus came <laughs> he's on the way to the cross and they're saying get out of here because Herod wants to kill you and Jesus says tell that fox and the word is alopex I, mean, I got it pronounced out here alopex I got that one right it's the word female fox which is the same thing as a female dog. You can put the rest of the words together. <coughs> Jesus said, you tell that female fox, look, I will keep driving out de demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. Herod cannot kill me before the time has come. I will drive out demonic activity in this world. And when I go to the cross, the power of all demons, Satan himself, will be destroyed. I will keep healing people so that they can be healed of their, of their, their diseases and so forth and come to true healing all eternity, for all eternity. I will do it today and tomorrow until the point comes where I lay down my life for my sheep. And on the third day, I will take it up again. I will reach my goal. It is to be perfected. My life will be complete and Scripture tells us to be perfect like our Heavenly Father is perfect. To be complete. To be done with sin. Because the power of God is so powerful in our life that these sins won't entangle us anymore. They have no desire in our life or anything else. Our goal is to be like Christ in this world because we're filled with the Spirit instead of filled with things that lead to drunkenness and disorderliness. Verse 33, Nevertheless... I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day. For it is not admissible for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. Nevertheless, 
Maybe you'll enter this narrow gate or not. Maybe you'll believe. Maybe Herod will. But of course, he wouldn't want to give up his title and his fame and his power. He wanted to see Jesus so Jesus would perform a miracle for him. Even though all these miracles had been done, Jesus said again, I'm not going to go do one for him. He, he can see the signs and believe. He has the scriptures that point to me. Herod chose not to believe. What about you? Do you believe? There are only a few that will be saved. Are you one of them? It is not admissible for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. More fulfillment of Scripture. Again, Jesus points to a sacrificial death as the Messiah. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And whenever you see that twice, you better look at it. It's only in Scripture six, eight times where it's twice like this. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the, the, the city of God where God should be dwelling who kills the prophets and stone those who sent her. Why will you not listen? Why will you not enter that narrow door? How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Oh, if I listen and I live my life as a humble servant, maybe, just maybe, they'll see the light that I have in Christ and He'll gather up my children. But you were unwilling. Look, your house your lineage, your heritage, your, your gift from God is left to you desolate. And I tell you that you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A lot of relationships are one-sided. Even marriages are one-sided. Jesus gives everything for you to come into a covenant-type marriage with him. That he'll come back and find his bride ready to be received. Do you love Him in the same way? Do you love Him enough to give up your life for the one who gave up His life for you? So what did Jesus mean when He said, Look, your house is left desolate, and I tell you that you will not see Me again until you say, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. What does that mean? I don't know. How's that? There's a lot of controversy. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Does that mean... Jesus, we're saying it, Jesus is saying it, I don't know. But I know what it is saying is that blessed is anyone who belongs to Jesus. Because He has established you as a child of God if you have strove to enter that narrow gate because you've put your faith and trust in Him. Fast forward in Luke some. In Luke 19, verse 36, as he rode along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. And as he approached the descent from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully in a loud voice for all the miracles they'd seen. Well, we'll just think about what we just read. Jesus said he would keep on performing miracles up until that day. Very next verse, verse 30. Um, my type small. 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Very similar verbiage. Jesus entered into Jerusalem as their king, as their savior. Note, note, note the, the people recognized him as the Messiah. But as a whole, as a nation of Israel, they killed their king. How? Uh, more proof that only a few will be saved. Only a few will find that narrow way. Uh, this is history. Real life. Jesus had done enough miracles and everything that the crowds had grown to such multitudes. He fed 5,000 men plus women and children in one event that we know of. But they didn't want to feed on the bread of life John 6, verse 66 says that many disciples departed from Him the day that they said you need to feed on the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna that came down from heaven in the wilderness and they died. But these are the words of eternal life. And Jesus came in and said, they said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. But if your lips profess it and their heart is not, if your heart is far from it, you're not blessed. You're not in a right standing with God. 
You're outside of that door. You have not entered in. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he answered, If they remain silent, the very stones will cry out. There were some disciples. There were some, there were few in that crowd that were true disciples that heard the words of Jesus to say to come and follow me, that heard these other words and then gave up. The scripture tells us immediately that the fishermen left their nets. They left their father's business and they came to follow after Jesus. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, it overwhelmed me with grief and he wept over it. And Jesus said, if only you had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The door was shut. The door was shut for the children of God, the nation of Israel, who had the prophets, who had the law, who had the covenants, who had the promises. The door was shut that day. The day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Because God knows in your heart whether you've accepted Him or not. He knew in just a few days you would turn and be against Him. Are you for Jesus or are you against Jesus? Are you gathering with Him for the kingdom? Are you scattering? The door is narrow. Strive that you enter into it. Make every effort. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will barricade you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. Your house will be desolate. Remember those words. They will not leave one stone on top of another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God and the door was shut. And in A.D. 70, that happened to the nation of Israel. It is a fact in history because they professed with their lips but did not believe in their heart that Jesus was the Son of God who died for their sins and they would not take up their, deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after Him. Do you have your Bibles? Turn to Revelation chapter 3. You can read with me. I don't know which translation yours is. I'm going to start in verse 14. The last of Jesus' letters to the churches, to those who profess His name. And this is the last letter, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write. This is chapter 3, verse 14. These are the words of the Amen. That means that you agree with Him. Amen! I agree with that, Pastor. The faithful and true witness the only witness to you, the one who is faithful, the true, that is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. He is the witness to you. And only a few will be saved. The originator of God's creation, which is you again. God created you in your mother's womb. He knew you before time existed as we know it again. He knew that you would sin and it would cost Him His Son's life. And Jesus says here, the one and only Son of God, the one and only way, the only truth, the only life, the faithful and true witness to you, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, let me clarify, I'm not saying that you church are the church of Laodicea. Don't throw rocks at me. But we might be. What I'm saying is examine yourself to tell your heavenly Father, to tell your Lord if your works are hot or cold. Because Scripture is clear here, and Jesus cries out from heaven after He's ascended and gave you the power and authority and said, don't worry about the kingdoms of this world, guys, but instead you will be my witnesses when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you Jesus' witnesses? But because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. The door will be shut on you, church, if you don't start showing works of repentance. You say, I'm rich, I've grown wealthy and need nothing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Do you realize your sin debt to God? Do you realize... You have sinned against the Creator of all things beyond what you can even fathom. And you have rebelled against Him and are still rebelling because we are still sinners saved by grace even after we've been saved. It is a struggle. It is a, it is a 
Salvation comes, but we have to grow from infancy to maturity in Christ. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may become rich, white garments so that you may be clothed, and your shameful nakedness not exposed, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those I love I rebuke and discipline. Therefore be earnest and repent. Repent, change your way you think so that your heart is changed so that your life is changed, so that it is proof that you are my brother, that you are a child of your Father in heaven. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I open the door, and I will come to him and dine with him, and he with me. Now that scripture is used so often as an invitation to people to come to Jesus for the first time. It is not a scripture for that. You can use it if you want to, but this scripture clearly here is to the church who is already proclaimed to know Jesus Christ. Whether they're saved or not saved, we won't go down that road or anything else, but they are not doing the works they should do. And whatever it means, Jesus is going to spew them or vomit them out of His mouth because of the fact that they're not doing the works that they should be doing. But if they repent and hear Jesus knocking at that narrow door, it's not shut for good yet. Because you've probably kind of put the door shut some. And Jesus is standing in the eternity of heaven saying, let me back in. Let me in for the first time. Whatever it may be. Believe, repent, and do the works you should do to show the proof of your faith. If anyone hears my voice and they open the door, huh? because Jesus hadn't shut it yet, you can still open it. I will come in and dine with them. Remember the scripture that we read earlier. They said we ate and drank with you. If you'll just open the door, you'll know for the fact. If you open it wide to Jesus, He'll come in and flood you. Give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. To know that when you die, the greatest tragedy of all will not be to hear from your Lord, who you profess with your mouth but not with your heart, I don't know you. But instead you'll hear because you've been doing the works, well done my good and faithful servant. To the one who overcomes I will grant the right to sit with me in my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my Father in His throne, after Jesus' work of self-denial was done in human form. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The greatest tragedy of all is to not open that door fully to Jesus and letting Him to come in. Father in heaven, Lord, help us to not harden our hearts. Lord, I pray that each and every one here has come to the realization of who Jesus Christ is and has accepted Him as their Lord. And Father, I continue with that prayer that each and every one, if they have not, that they will, and for those who need to, including myself, to open that door even wider to let Jesus fully come in that today is that day when we don't make excuses, that we realize that we don't have a clue how much time that we have, that the greatest gift of all has been given and we celebrate it each Christmas, that you would send your one and only Son to this earth, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. Oh God, help us to work out, out that with fear and trembling to realize the sin debt that we have before you, O oh Father, and to know that, that Jesus Christ paid it all and has empowered us and given us authority to live as He lived in this world, not building up treasures here on earth which will, which will be destroyed, Father, which mean nothing in the fulfillment of, of our joy and peace that we have. But Lord, help us to be rich towards you, rich towards the kingdom of God, to, to the, live to the point in, in such a lavishness, Father, that we leave this world bankrupt from, from wor worldly things, but build up so much equity in heaven, Father. Oh, Father, help us to be rich towards you because of how rich you are towards us, that Jesus gave up heaven 
and came and humbly laid down His life before us. Help us to strive in agony to enter through that narrow door and help us to do that upholding one another and helping each other through the door, Father. We thank you and praise you for the words of life that you have given us, Father, and that the word of life became flesh and dwelt among us and laid down his life for his sheep. Help us to hear our shepherd's voice and to be obedient, Father. Increase our faith, Lord, that we may live a life that brings glory and honor to you. And one day here, well done, my good and faithful servant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.